Come on, I want you to just take your Bible and uh, go to 2 Kings in the Old Testament, 2 Kings chapter 19. I'm going to just share some things about the power of deep roots. The power of deep roots. While you're turning there, let me just share something um, with you. A little bit about us. My name is Glenn Blake, and my wife Lynn. Uh, we have been in ministry for, wow, wow, 26, 27 years, I guess, full time. Traveled uh, all over the place, seen a lot of cool things happen. And uh, our ministry is called Awake Nations. We'd love for you to connect with us. We're on Facebook. You can just check uh, Glenn Lynn Blakeney or go to Awake Nations. And uh, we also have a website. It's awakenations.org. So what was that website? Just make sure everybody's listening. <laughs> awakenations.org. There you go. Lots of stuff um, happening this year. We have, um, wow, so many op more opportunities than we can f fulfill. Let's put it that way. And... Um, we're, and when we leave here, we've got a, we've got a few days off, and then we're uh, headed up to Ottawa for several days of ministry. We preach in a lot of different ethnic circles. Is that, that's good, isn't it? Yeah, it is. And uh, so next weekend, we're ministering in a church in Ottawa. Most of the um, believers there are from Africa, um, West Africa in particular. Uh, Ghana is, a, is the pastors from Ghana. And we love Africa. We go to Africa a lot, enjoy Africa, seeing what God is doing there. But uh, there are a lot of other places in the world that um, God is uh, doing some very powerful things. One of the places right now that we have our, uh, our sights set upon is a little country north of India in between China called Nepal. You ever heard of that country? Very, very few Christians there. Very few. It's one of the most unevangelized places on the planet. And uh, we have the opportunity to go there, train pastors, um, do some crusades. And uh, we're going to the United Arab Emirates later this year, to India, Australia, New Zealand, um, a lot of different places. You know, we just, we just want to go back to Africa this year. It's not going to work. It doesn't look like it. Um, we're traveling throughout Canada and the United States as well, um, Mexico. And we're actually doing a crusade. You guys, this is awesome. You know, we're doing a crusade in September on the border of Texas in the United States and Mexico in a place called Laredo or Nuevo Laredo in Mexico. For those of you who, you know, Espanol, right? But the, the fact is, that's where the drug cartels are. It's one of the most dangerous places. It's where the, you know, the fence is there, the border. They're jumping over. They're bringing drugs across. The drug cartel is there. It's a very, very dangerous place. And a lot of people don't realize that they think this is some type of um, natural battle, you know, where it's, uh, it's, it's engaging with, uh, uh, you know, with military, the military against the drug lords and all that kind of stuff. But this is spiritual. Do you understand that? This is a spiritual battle. In fact, the, most of the drug dealers are deeply spiritual. Did you know that? They use witchcraft. Santeria. Santeria is a form of witchcraft where they take Catholicism and witchcraft and they blend it together. And uh, they, have, they have their deities. They have their uh, little idols that they use to put curses on uh, the army and the military and, and uh, even pastors. And, uh, you know, so they can, they can be protected uh, from bullets. They can be protected from the authorities. Just, it's an amazing thing. And uh, so we, we are going there. So we appreciate your prayers. Because um, this isn't, uh, this isn't uh, you know, a picnic, right? Uh, this is engaging in spiritual warfare. So we appreciate your, your prayers. Um, the, the truth is, Jesus said, and we learned this yesterday, or we're reminded of it, for those of you who already knew, is the one thing that unequivocally will usher in the return of the Lord Jesus Christ and the end of the world. You know what it is? How many know what it is? You want to see Jesus come back? If I tell you how to make him come back, will you do it? Yeah, the gospel of the kingdom preached as a witness to all the nations of the world, and then the end will come. Matthew 24, 14. Okay. Jesus said, I give you power to be witnesses, not pew warmers. Come on. So 
the whole reality is, if he gives us power to fulfill the Great Commission, and it is a commission, meaning that he's not going to do it himself, and we can't do it on our own. It's a commission. We're collaborating. We're working together. Amen? Amen. I'm preaching better than you're amen in me right now, but that's okay. Is everybody uh, uh, sleeping, or what is this? Okay. <laughs> Every, okay, come on now. Let's, come on, let's shout. Come on, say the name of Jesus. Come on. Hallelujah, Jesus. Now listen, it's no excuse if you say, well, I'm a Canadian. I'm quiet. I don't care. I'm a Canadian too, but I'm not quiet. I'm going to tell you if, you, if you take your finger and you put it in an electrical outlet, I don't care what you say, what my personality type is or my, or my ethnic background. You're going you're gonna to shout, okay? And when you get connected to the power source, you're going to have to get some emotion and some passion. <laughs> Hallelujah. Amen. So, let's talk about the power of deep roots. How many are in 2 Kings chapter 19? Is anybody there yet? Okay. All right. You ready? Here, here, here's what I want to tell you before we go into, into the teaching time. Um, my wife and I were in a meeting about a year ago with Mike Bickle. Do you know who Mike Bickle is? Okay. He's the, the guy who oversees the International House of Prayer in Kansas City, and Misty Edwards was there as well. And in that meeting, Mike shared, it was just a very small group of us, he shared one of his major concerns for the emerging generation. You want me, you want me to tell you what it is? You ready? They don't know the word. That's what he said. Okay. He said, you, you can imagine those guys. Prayer going on 24-7, right? Some of the greatest praise and worship on the planet. Okay. And, and Mike's concern is the, the emerging generation doesn't know the word of God. Okay. So uh, let me tell you that even as Pastor mentioned, the, the whole truth of the matter is, is that when Jesus was on the earth, Jesus ministered in the power of the Holy Spirit like unprecedented. Like, like no, nothing even we've even seen today. And yet, Jesus completely was immersed in the Word and ministered the Word, didn't he? And he said, the words that I speak to you, they are spirit and they are life, right? So the words are, there's power in the Word of God. And, but let me tell you this. I, I, I mentioned this yesterday very briefly. I said, you can have a demonstration without revelation. Okay? In other words, you can have an encounter with God, a miraculous encounter with God, you can be healed, you can be touched by God, you can see a miracle in your life, and you're like, wow, that was cool, what was that about? Okay? So you can have a demonstration without revelation, absolutely. But you will not see transformation apart from revelation. If you're going to see transformation in your life, you're going to have to have revelation. You're going to have to have the Holy Spirit speaking to you through the Word, teaching you. Because the Bible says this, it says in Psalm 103 that the children of Israel witnessed his acts, but Moses knew his ways. Moses knew his ways. And let me tell you something. I don't want to just witness the acts of God. I want to know his ways. In other words, I want to know what it takes to release and to activate those things on the earth. Because Pastor mentioned this, and it's so true. God, <laughs> you know, I... There's some sacred cows we have in our thinking um, that we need to grind up into hamburger meat, right? Because we're calling out and asking God to do stuff that he's already done. He's already done it. He said it is finished. It is finished, meaning it's complete. Walk in it. Receive what I've done. Don't ask me to do it. But take what I've given to you and walk it out. Live it out. Apply it to your life. Seek the principles. Seek the person of Jesus Christ. Seek revelation from him so that you can walk in the ways of God. Because ignorance isn't an excuse, is it? It's not an excuse. You have, hey, if people in other parts of the world where they do not have access to a Bible are living out miracles and seeing the power of God manifested, and we're not, and we have a Bible in what are, how many translations in English, right? How many translations in French? Come on. We have access to the Word of God. And what, what do you think is going to happen to us when we stand before God? And he's like, why didn't you do what I told you to do? 
Well, I didn't know. I gave you my word. I gave you my spirit. You see? It's very important that we, under, we, we learn the ways of the Lord. Get in the word. Study the word. Pray the word. Confess the word. Learn it. Meditate on it. Until, you know, it, it becomes second nature to you. Everything that's written in this book. 2 Kings 19, verse 30. I'm just going to read one verse. Here's what it says. It says, And the remnant that has escaped of the house of Judah shall again, say again, again take root downward and bear fruit upward. The remnant that has escaped from the house of Judah shall again take root downward and bear fruit, what? Upward. Amen. Now, I want to talk to you about the power of deep roots this morning. I want to share with you about what I believe is happening in the body of Christ. So this is a prophetic message. This is a message I believe that um, everyone in the body of Christ needs to hear right now. Because we're in a season where we are in transition. Transition is a kind of difficult place to be. Because it's not where you once were, but it's not yet where you need to be. And so transition, for example, when you're, you know, ladies, when you're having a baby, right? Transition isn't a fun, a fun place to be. It's not a lot of it, you know, it, how many want to be in transition? Transition is not a good place to be. But we know that the purpose of transition is to take us to a destination. God does not want to leave us into the wil in the wilderness. The children of Israel came out of Egypt, but what for, for what purpose? That they would stay in the wilderness? No, that God would bring them through the wilderness into the land of milk and honey, into Canaan, the ultimate destination that he had for their lives. So I really believe we're living in a season where we are in transition. For those of you who have been saved, how many have been saved more than, say, 25 years? You've been a Christian more than 25 years. You've been in the charismatic uh, you know, spirit-filled realm for more than 25 years. Okay, for those of you who have, and even longer, you understand that things are really different today in the church, aren't they? And, and what I mean by that is, you know, there's some things that definitely I thank God for the change. I thank God for the transition. It's, it's very, very significant what the Lord has been doing. But there's some things that I don't like about the church. Is that all right? I think there's some things Jesus doesn't like about it, too. If you read Revelation 2 and 3, he wrote seven letters, and five out of the seven churches he had to correct. Five out of seven. So Jesus corrects us because he loves us, and he wants us to change. Come on now. He wants us to change because the purpose of his correction is to discipline us so that we become more like Jesus Christ, and we're able to fulfill the calling that he has upon our lives. Because we cannot do this in our own strength. We cannot do this in our own power, what he's called us to do. Not only is Christianity the only quote-unquote religion that the founder attends every meeting, but it's also the only quote-unquote religion where we're called to do something that's impossible for us to do. All other religions, do your best. Try hard. If you fail, discipline yourself. Get back up again. See, Jesus didn't come to repair us. He came to resurrect us. See, Jesus came literally not just to heal us, but to raise us to life again. And the way that works is we've got to recognize that we're called to die. We're called to die. In fact, there's, there's so many references to that in the Scripture. But I want to talk to you about this season in which we're in. I really believe that we are in a season right now where things are really, really dry spiritually. Now, now listen to me. Somebody said, well, I'm experiencing, experiencing the presence of God in a very powerful way. Awesome. Good for you. Me too. But here's what I'm saying. Generally speaking, generally speaking, what is happening now, for those of you, how many were around during the charismatic renewal? Okay. If you were around during the charismatic renewal, you remember what God did? Come on. It's not happening today. I mean, the miracles, the signs and wonders, the people that were being saved, the amount of people that were being filled with the Holy Spirit, powerful, powerful, incredible. And there's been some great things that have been happening, but in small pockets for the most part. 
I've traveled to many different nations of the world. I see God do incredible things. But by and large, what I see happening in the West is disconcerting. There's really a sense here that things are dry. You know, we, we speak about the coming glory, and then 10 years later, we're speaking and preaching and, and praying for the coming glory. 10 years later, we're still preaching and speaking about the coming glory. There's something wrong with that picture. Something is wrong with that, like, like God is holding back from us for some reason. Now listen, I do not believe that the Lord is holding back from us in the sense that it's not his will or it's not his timing even. But I believe that he is wanting to pour out his spirit now in an unprecedented way. He's wanting to reveal himself to us and to, to our cities, to our families, to the generations, to the nations. But the reality is that God is looking for people that will learn to walk in that place of power and authority. And the truth is, we are living in a season right now where I, I think, for the most part, there's, there's just a, a lot of challenge, there's a lot of obstacles, there's a lot of um, difficulties that have, have, have loomed up and, and, you know, tried to stand in the way for us to be able to move forward and do the will of God. We were living in the United States. We're originally from Canada, but we lived in the United States for about 12 years. And when we were living there, I remember in 2008 when the economy went boom. Down there, especially in, in Florida where we were living, it was, it was, the economy was in, you know, profoundly impacted. But let me tell you that a lot of ministries, churches shut down during that time. They couldn't, keep, they couldn't pay their bills, honestly. There were churches that shut down. There were, there were pastors that said, you know what? We can't bring in guest speakers anymore. I know pastors that had to, to go out and get jobs. That formerly, they were, they, were, you know, they were not bivocational, but they had to go and become bivocational ministers. And, and a lot of things changed in negative ways. And, and during that whole time, I, I just knew that in my spirit that this was the enemy. It wasn't God. And, and the Lord basically began to speak to me, and he said, look it. He said, here's what I'm, I'm doing in this day. He said, I am shaking everything that can be shaken. And what is going to happen, he said, is you're going to see many of my people are going to fall by the wayside. They're going to collapse under the stress. They're not going to be able to stand up. But thank God that a lot of times where our greatest victories happen after we we experience some of our most profound defeats. When we get to the place where we collapse and we say, you know what, I don't know what's going on here, but I feel defeated. The enemy has just walked all over me, and uh, I, here I am, you know, I'm, I'm on the ground, dirt kicked in my face, but I am determined. I am determined that I am going to press into God, and I'm going to seek him, until he breathes life back into these dry bones. Until God resurrects me and makes me alive, sets me back on my feet again, and speaks to me and says, this is the way, walk in it. And I begin to understand what it is that God is calling me to do. Because I am assured, I am confident that what has been happening in the world, what has been challenging us in terms of, of the postmodern culture that we live in, the post-Christian culture that we live in, you know what that's like in Quebec. With the, you know, everybody hates the church. Everybody doesn't want anything. You know, they don't want to do anything with Christianity, with religion. And it's not just in Quebec. It's all over the Western Hemisphere. It's in Europe. It's in America. It's, it's, it's in, in the rest of Canada where people now are in a position where they do, they, you know, it's kind of like, well, Jesus is cool, but the church sucks. Come on. Jesus is okay. He's, yeah, you know, but church, no thank you. And listen, it's tough to break through this stuff, isn't it? It's very, very difficult. But the reality is, who are we called to present to our culture? Are we called to present the church to the culture? No, we're called to present, come on, Jesus. We're called to present Jesus. So the church, we are the church, but the church is the body of Christ. The church is literally, Jesus said this. He said, 
if you want to see me, he said, if you want to see the Father, look at me. But Ephesians 1.19, Paul prayed that we would be filled with the fullness of God. The body of Christ would be filled with the fullness of God. So here's what he's saying. He's saying, my prayer is for you, is that in this season, I'm sorry, Colossians 1.19, I believe that is, in this season, that you would be filled with the fullness of God. So listen to me, what I'm about to say. We should be able to say to the world, do you want to see what Jesus is like? Look at us. That's what we should be able to say. The world, those who do not know the Lord, has seen a lot of religion, haven't they? They've seen a lot of religiosity and churchianity. But the truth is that they have not seen the power of the resurrected Jesus living in a people. A people that walk in the glory. We, we talked about yesterday about Peter's gl- shadow, healing the sick. We talked about aprons and handkerchiefs touching the body of Paul so that demons came out of people. You see, when the power of God is manifested in these ways, I can tell you something. You will, we will never have a problem with church growth. Pastors will never have to go to another church growth seminar in their life. Okay, because what will happen is people will be coming here at 5 o'clock in the morning lining up to get into this building. And it'll be just a matter of time before you're going to have to obviously get a larger facility. When the power of God begins to manifest in these ways, we will never have an issue attracting people. Look at the apostles. Look at Jesus' ministry. Great multitudes. Great multitudes. Now, I know not everyone understood, you know, the the significance and, and the cost of discipleship. But the point I'm trying to make right now is that there is definitely never an issue in the New Testament with drawing people. We were ministering in Nigeria, and uh, we did a crusade in a village, and long story short, at the end of the crusade, we had thousands of people showed up, and many, many people were saved, turned to the Lord, many miracles happened. And what ended up happening is um, we, I, I was asked to speak in this church in the Delta State. And while I was ministering in this church, um, we had a lot of miracles happen. Crippled people started walking. Was one man was HIV positive. He was healed. God completely healed him. And the word got out after we left, after we went back to, to Canada, uh, the pastor, literally then a couple of Sundays later, had thousands of people showed up at his church. I mean, he already had about 1,000 people in his church or more, and, and thousands of more people showed up. And, and it was because they heard about the miracles. They heard what had taken place. And, you know, they, they, they came regardless of who was there. But they heard that God was at work. So I'm telling you, there's absolutely no reason why we cannot see this take place here. Do you think that God looks over at India or, or Pakistan or Africa or some of these other places in the world and goes, you know what, I like those people better? You know? It's, it's you, you people, you know, in Quebec, uh, you know, I, I just don't like you. Or you people in Canada or you people in the United States or wherever, you people in Germany or I, I just don't like you. Do you think that's the way God is? He died for everybody. He gave us the Holy Spirit to everyone. There's no difference. He wants us to experience his power and his glory. I want to go to Africa. I want to go to India and tell them that some of the most powerful miracles I've ever seen happen have occurred in Quebec. That's what I want us to be able to say. That I've seen blind eyes open in Quebec. That I've, seen, that I've seen the dead raised to life in, in Canada. You see, that we don't talk just about come here and tell about all the stories on the mission field, you know? Like, come on now. Is this the will of God? Everywhere the apostles went, they raised the dead, they cast out demons, they healed the sick. Miracles occurred. Great multitudes were brought into the fellowship of the saints. And the secret, I believe in seeing this situation turn around because we need a breakthrough is what we need today. We need a breakthrough. And what it's going to take is it's not going to take us, you know, more, more proficient worship, you know, more polished sermonizing. 
You know, it's not our education, it's not our eloquence, it's not our expertise that is going to change the situation spiritually and morally in our land. It's the power and the anointing of the gospel of Jesus Christ. And the irony is, we are living in a day when in the Western Hemisphere, many of our churches, even those that were formerly embraced the fullness of the operation of the Holy Spirit, have now become what, quote unquote, seeker sensitive in the sense that they are doing what they can to be able to attract crowds. But the reality is many of these churches are a mile wide, a kilometer wide, but they're only an inch deep, a centimeter deep. I have a friend who was radically converted to Christ, had a visitation literally in a pub in Ireland. Jesus showed up, knocked him off his bar stool. He got saved, started preaching the gospel all over the world. And what ended up happening is he started a church in a very affluent suburb of a large metropolitan area in the United States next to one of the largest seeker-sensitive churches there. People would go to that seeker sensitive church, they'd get saved, but then they, after a while they started showing up at his church. Now, he didn't strategically plant his church beside that church, but they just started coming to his church. They started to get delivered, healed, baptized with the Holy Spirit. One day he had me come and minister, and I was ministering, and there was a lady that came forward and uh, I, she said to me, would you pray for me? I struggle with this, and I struggle with that, and it was a lot of emotional stuff. And, and uh, so I laid hands on her, and I prayed for her, and she fell down under the power of the Holy Spirit, and she was baptized with the Holy Spirit, and she started speaking in tongues. After the service was over, I went out for lunch with the pastor, and the pastor told me, he said, do you know who that woman is? And I said, no, I've never heard of her. He told me her name. Let me just tell you that she was one of the most well-known, renowned psychiatrists in the Western world. A psychiatrist, a lesbian, who had recently come to Jesus Christ, like two or three weeks prior to that, she came to a home Bible study, was touched by the presence of God, came there, and that day God touched her with her power, totally set her free, delivered her, turned her life around, filled her with the Holy Spirit. <laughs> One of the most renowned psychiatrists. A psychiatrist is MD, right? Not PhD. You understand that? And so God moved in such a powerful, powerful way. Hallelujah. And I'm telling you, that is the only thing that's going to change our culture today. Hallelujah. I was ministering in Toronto, and uh, it was the, the, the church, most of the people were from the West Indies in the church. And I gave an invitation for people to get their heart right with God. And this family came forward. The father came first, and the mother, and then the children most of them, was there was one young, young man who was about 16, 17 years of age, and then he had some sisters, and they were also probably, you know, one or two were older than him, and one or two were younger than him. And so I began to pray for the family, and I, laid, I just touched the young man right here, and I just prayed that the Holy Spirit would touch him. And he turned around, and he ran out of the church, literally out the doors into the parking lot of the church when I touched him. And I said, what is going on? And some of the ushers, they went out, and they tra tra tracked him down, and eventually the pastor went outside, and, and then I came out. And when I came outside, he was holding on to a, a, like a, a sign in the parking lot, and he said, keep away from me. Stay away from me. And, and I was, okay, what's going on here? And so I got closer, and he said, when he touched me, he said, I felt fire burn through my whole body. And he said, and it scared me. And he was, I mean, he's sweating. And, and this is what he says. He says, I don't know what this is, but all I know is I want to be baptized. That's what he said. I want to be baptized. Ha, <laughs> ha, The power of God to break through, to break through the strongholds of the enemy. Hallelujah. Praise be to his name. Listen, what is it going to take? If you are facing obstacles, if you've come up against a wall, if the heavens seem as brass, 
You know, if God doesn't seem as close to you as he once was, let me tell you, if you can't go forward, you need to go deeper. You need to go deeper. In this passage, in 2 Kings 19, verse 30, it speaks of a remnant. A remnant is part, a remnant is a small representation of a larger group, correct? A remnant is also that which has been preserved from the original. You can have a remnant or a piece of carpet. We call it a remnant of carpet. That is what has been preserved. In, in the New Testament and in the Old Testament, the idea of remnant is that type of people that have literally escaped a great tragedy. For example, a people that have escaped a holocaust. A people that, that maybe, you know, the vast majority have been decimated, but somehow they've been preserved. And so I want you to see today that, that God is in this day, in this time, he still has a remnant. He still has a people. See, a remnant being part of the original, they still have the DNA of the, of the, of the kingdom of God, of the New Testament way in them. Because there are a lot of people out there that profess the name of Jesus, but the DNA of the kingdom is not in them. The DNA of God is not in them. And you understand that, that what God is trying to do in this day is, is what he has done is he's preserved the people. He set apart a people in these last days. And these people aren't necessarily well known. They're not necessarily in the limelight. But they are people that maybe are flying under the radar right now. But the reality is that God has a people, a remnant people, that he has set apart for these last days. He wants to see his glory and his power manifested on the earth. And the way it's going to happen is through a people that come into that place of encounter and relationship with him. Listen, he says that there will be a remnant that have escaped of the house of Judah. They've been preserved. They'll take root downward, and they're going to bear fruit upward. Listen, Jesus said that his father chose and appointed us to bear an abundance of lasting fruit. You did not choose me, but I chose you and appointed you that you should go and bear fruit and that your fruit should remain, John 15, 16. Jesus said elsewhere in Matthew 7, 17, even so, every good tree brings forth good fruit. John 15, 8, my father is glorified by this, that you bear much fruit and so prove to be my disciples, the New American says. You prove to be my disciples. So the existence or the presence of fruit in your life is the proof that you belong to Jesus. Every good tree bears what kind of fruit? Good fruit. Every good tree bears good fruit. God wants us to understand that fruit is not an option for the believer. Fruit is a requirement. It's of necessity that we bear much fruit. But understand this. We say, well, what is the fruit that God is talking about? Well, we could say in Galatians 5, he's talking about the fruit of the Spirit, right? Love, joy, peace, patience, and so on. James 3.18, the fruit of righteousness. The fruit of the Spirit, the fruit of righteousness, the fruit of God's life in us. But let me give you a very simple definition of fruit. What is fruit? In the natural, fruit is a manifestation or an expression of the life that is in a tree. The life that is in the vine, the life that is in a tree, fruit is a manifestation or an expression, the visible expression of the invisible life that is in that tree. So if the life of God is in us, and 2 Peter 1, 4 says we are partakers of the divine nature, his life is in us, then it only stands to reason that the fruit of God's life will be manifested in our lives. Jesus said, either make the tree good, cut it down. Do you understand? He's patient. In the parable in Luke 13, he said, three years. Isn't that amazing? There's a lot we could talk about. Three years he trained his disciples, didn't he? In three years, our life can be transformed. In three years, transformed completely. But understand that God is saying, I want to see fruit in your lives. Fruit is so important. Amen? Now, let me, let me say something about this. The, in the natural, the secret to ensuring a harvest of rich, rich, luxuriant fruit is the health and the vitality of the root system. So here's the way it works. First, the root... 
then the shoot, then the fruit. First the root, then the, then the shoot, then the fruit, correct? So the fact is, if a tree is not healthy, a lot of times there's an issue with the root system. And Paul said this in Romans 11:16. if the root is holy, so are the branches. If the root is holy, so are the branches. So what we're dealing with is that we must have healthy roots that are planted firmly in Christ if we're going to display the fruit of the Spirit to our world. Colossians chapter 2, 6, and 7. And now, just as you accepted Christ Jesus as your Lord, you must continue to follow him. Let your roots grow down into him and let your lives be built on him that your faith will grow strong in the truth you were taught and you will overflow with thankfulness. You've got to have deep roots. Here's what I'm saying, saints. In this day, in this age in which we're living, there are a lot of people Come on, I'm, I'm talking about there are people that come to church still, still today, out of tradition and ritual, and sometimes because I have to come. And you have never yet come into that place where you have a personal relationship with Jesus. You, you don't know him. You don't hear his voice. You don't feel his presence. You don't experience his miracles. But you show up to church. You don't open your Bible. You don't pray hardly during the week. Maybe if you get in trouble, you pray. But see, that's not what God wants for you. That's not what he wants for me. Do you know what the Bible says? By our traditions, we can make the word of God of none effect. By our traditions, we can make the word of God of no effect. The same word that, G that God spoke through his son Jesus and said, Let there be light, and there was light. We can render that word void. We can negate its power through our religious traditions. Come on. Because he's a gentleman, he'll never force himself upon us. But there's so much power. There's so much grace that's available to us if we will recognize what it is that he wants to do, how he wants to reveal himself. And I'm telling you that if you have been loving God, if you've been serving God, there are many, many Christians that I know right now whose faith has been thrown into the fire. They're being tested. They're being challenged. They're experiencing difficulties and hardships. There's obstacles in their life. If it isn't directly themselves, it, perhaps it's their business or, or perhaps it's a loved one that they, you know, close to them that, that the enemy has seemed to have gotten a hold of them and, and is wreaking destruction in their life. And, and let me tell you that today that you are not in this alone, that God Almighty is there with you and he's waiting to display his glory and his power and he's wanting to move on your behalf and do what seems to be impossible because God is willing that none should perish. God is willing that you would not lack, that you would not, you know, live in that place of want and that place of, of, of just not having those things that he has for you. And I don't just mean materially. That's the problem. The church is so focused on materialism. That's why there's been a drought because we focused on the material so much. And listen, yes, he provides all my needs. Yes, he takes care of all of my needs. He prospers his people. He provides for his people. Absolutely. But the way is through seeking first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. It's not through seeking after the stuff. I said this yesterday. I know so many pastors that are getting involved in, in all of these different, you know. I know so many pastors that their ministry, I can tell you, literally, just off the top of my head, about 10 different pastors I know that have ruined their ministries getting involved in Ponzi scams. Why did they go into this stuff? Because to them, it was some of them were desperate financially. Some were greedy. Some were, were just duped and deceived. They, they had good intentions. But the reality is, people, we're living in a day and a season where we better hear what God is speaking. We better be listening to hear what he's speaking. Because if we don't, we're going we're gonna to take the wrong turn on the road somewhere, and we're going to go over a cliff. That's how serious it is. We've got to be listening to what 
the Holy Spirit is saying. Now more than ever. You cannot be dependent upon someone else hearing the voice of God for you. You must hear the voice of the Lord for yourself. You must be pressing into him. You must have personal discernment because of the days in which we live. And how do you get that? You're going to go deeper. Let me share this scripture with you in 2 Corinthians chapter 1. If you just go there, please. 2 Corinthians chapter 1. This particular verse of scripture has had such an impact upon my life. Second Corinthians chapter 1. I'm going to start reading at verse number 8. This is Paul the Apostle preaching. He says, For we do not want you to be ignorant, brethren, of our trouble which came to us in Asia. We were burdened beyond measure. Say beyond measure. Above strength. Say above strength. So that we despaired even of life. Look at verse 9. Yes, we had the sentence of death in ourselves, that we should not trust in ourselves, but in God who raises the dead. Listen to me. Paul had an abundance of revelation. Paul literally went to the third heaven. Paul had encounters with God. Paul raised the dead. He, he saw miracles happen, profound miracles happen. And Paul says that there have been many troubles that have, come, that have literally come against me, many troubles that I've experienced. And he said, in the midst of all of this, he said, there has been a purpose. God's purpose in all of this is to bring me to the place called wit's end. The place where I would let go and let God. The place where I would say, you know what? I can't do this on my own. But let me tell you that the greatest battle that we contend with as Christians is not getting God to do something for us. Obviously, he's more willing than we could, we could ever imagine. And it's not against the devil. Because I read something about his power has been stripped for him. Come on. That he's a toothless lion against us now. But yet, there's still a issue. There's something that we contend with as Christians. You know what it is? It's us. It's a spirit of independence. It's a spirit that says, you know what? I'll take care of this. I got this one covered. God, if I need you, I'll call for backup. Right? Come on. Let's keep it real. Let's keep it real. All right. So what happens is it's kind of like, hey, I got this figured out, right? You know what? I can't pay my bills this month. No problem. I've got overdraft on my account. I've got a credit card. I can take care of this. You know what? I'm sick. No problem. I've got a doctor. Right? Free medical coverage in Canada. Right? Kind of, yeah. But what about Christians in the world who don't have any of this stuff? Come on now. What about Christians that don't have any of this stuff? What are they going to do? Die? Be poor? I'm telling you, it says we have the sentence of death in ourselves that we might not trust in ourselves, but in God who raises the dead. The battle is getting to the place where we let go and not our second response, but our first response is, God, you take care of this. God, you are the one who provides for me. You are my restorer. We look to him by default, not as a backup. And we come to the place where we learn to stop depending and relying upon ourselves, our wisdom, our strength, our resources, and we come to the place where we say to God, God, you've called me to trust in you with all of my heart and lean not on my own understanding. And God, I am going to let go and I'm going to come to the place where I say it is your plan, it is your call, and therefore you are responsible and I look to you. My eyes are on you. You are my deliverer. You are my provider. You are my way maker. And when we look to him in that way, guess what happens? He said we move into a place called 
the resurrection realm. We have the sentence of death in ourselves that we might not trust in ourselves. But in God who raises the dead, the resurrection realm, where nothing is too difficult, where nothing is impossible, where if we need to walk on water, we can walk on some water. If we need to raise the dead, we can raise the dead. No matter what it is that we come up against, we can pray and we can see those mountains move because we are seated in that place of heavenly resurrection power where we speak and God acts. Hallelujah. Let me close with this. In the natural, there are two things that literally would affect a root system. Number one, blight or disease. Blight or disease, getting into a plant, getting into the root system, will eventually create a toxic system uh, that will deliver toxicity and poison into the plant, thus killing it, correct? The Bible says, beware lest there be any root of bitterness in you. Any root of bitterness in you. The root of bitterness is that which inwardly defiles us and spreads. It manifests outwardly, but it starts in the inward. Jesus was very clear in Mark chapter 7, one translation. He says, it is what comes from inside that defiles you. For from within, out of a person's heart, come evil thoughts, sexual immorality, theft, murder, adultery, greed, wickedness, deceit, lustful desires, envy, slander, pride, and foolishness. All of these vile things come from within. They are what defile you. You see, so we have to be careful that anything in us that is not of God is uprooted. Jeremiah 1.10 says, See, I've set you this day over nations and kingdoms to root out, to pull down, to destroy, and to throw down, to build and to plant. Four terms of destruction, two terms of construction. Do you understand that if God is going to build something in the natural, if we're going to build something, right? Sometimes we've got to do some tearing down, don't we? Clear the land, uproot trees, right? Up, you know, dis, 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 dislodge stones or rocks or whatever. So there has to be an uprooting in our lives of so that which is toxic. If there's envy, if there's bitterness, if there's slander, if there's, if there's sexual immorality, if there's lust, if there's any of these things present in our lives, it defiles us. And you see, the truth of the matter is, God is looking for vessels of honor. In 2 Timothy 2.21, it says, If anyone cleanses himself from the latter, he will be a vessel for honor, sanctified and useful for the master, prepared for every good work. I love the way the message puts it. Listen to this. This is the message, 2 Timothy 2. In a well-furnished kitchen, there are not only crystal goblets and silver platters, but there are waste cans and compost buckets. Some containers are used to serve fine meals, others to take out the garbage. Become the kind of container God can use to present any and every kind of gift to his guests for their blessing. Here we are trying to deliver life, salvation, healing, and trash can lids in compost buckets to people. But the reality is, he said, you're called to be vessels of honor. If there's anything in you that is unlike Jesus, he wants to get rid of it. He wants to pull it out. The second thing that will hinder fruit and will, and will literally cut off the power of life from the root system is what I call shallow roots. The Bible says that we are called to be trees of righteousness, the planting of the Lord. Isaiah chapter 61, verse 3, that he may be glorified. Now, the interesting thing, the word there in Isaiah for trees in the Hebrew language means a very strong tree, like an oak tree, a tree that has deep roots. Do you know that an oak tree doesn't bear, doesn't produce acorns or fruit, so to speak? I believe it's until it's about the 40th year. So do you understand that all of that time, the root system, you know, it's maturing, it's, it's becoming strong. And, you know, I'm not saying that, that God wants us to be fruitless for, for those many years. I'm just trying to make a point that it's important that we recognize that we have deep roots. It says the remnant that has escaped of the house of Judah, they will take root downward and bear fruit upward. There will be a people in the midst of this darkness, in the midst of these dry seasons and this spiritual drought that we may be in compared 
to what we once had and what's happening even in other places of the world, but they're going to continue to bear fruit. They're going to bear much fruit for the glory of their Father. You can bear much fruit for the glory of your Father even in the midst of places and, you know, and even churches. Come on now. I know people that live in places where, where there's not even a single church that's on fire in close proximity where they are, and yet they're still on fire. They're still serving God. They're still, because why? Because their relationship is with God, not with the church. It's important is that we go to church, and we need that because we need one another. We need teaching. We need fellowship. We need all of these things. We need to come together collectively. As important as all that is, it can, it's not a replacement for your personal relationship with God. You've got to be a man or a woman who has a relationship with God, who's in the Word, who prays, who walks with God, and who chooses to glorify His name through your life and your actions. Come on. Yeah, amen. Thank you, Jesus. Hallelujah. So you've got to go deep. Listen. We have been called to be, tree, we've been called to be oaks of righteousness, not tumbleweeds. Come on. Right. We, we've got to have deep roots. And, you know, we are living in a season, as I said, that it, it just seems in the natural that, that it's, it's a difficult time. It's, you know, it's a time of, of drought. It's a time where, where the heavens are as brass and the ground has dried up and and you know what? But the fact is, listen to me. I'm going to read this to you from Jeremiah chapter 17, verse 7 and 8 from the New Living Translation. It says, But blessed are those who trust in the Lord and have made the Lord their hope and confidence. They're like trees planted along a riverbank with roots that reach deep into the water. Such trees are not bothered by the heat or worried by long months of drought. Their leaves stay green and they never stop producing fruit. Why is it that drought doesn't bother them? Because, and why is it that their leaves continually are green and they continuously bear fruit? Because it says they have roots that reach deep. The King James says they have roots that they spreadeth out their roots. Their roots reach deep. What does that mean? It literally means this. A tree has something called a taproot, correct? And a taproot literally will dig through the soil and when the ground dries up, the taproot will continue to tunnel tirelessly until it strikes the nourishment that it needs in the water in the subterranean recesses of the earth. So it has a, it has a root that goes deeper. And so what I'm telling you is in these seasons of dryness, the only way things are going to change is not by us just sitting there saying, Hey, God, what's going on? When are you going to change things? He's saying, uh, change things? No. How about you change things? How about you change? Because I'm God and I never change. <laughs> but I mentioned this yesterday. I want to reiterate it. There are a lot of Christians that will, I've, I've seen these on, you know, these hokey church signs that, you know, have the, come on now. I saw, I saw one battleground Baptist was the name of the church. I said, good Lord, I don't want to go there. <laughs> and under, underneath it said, undenominational. <laughs> undenominational. I said, wow. So <laughs> that was in the backwoods, I'm telling you. <laughs> you know the place where the women have the tooth missing and they chew tobacco and corn cob pipes? <laughs> Oh, thank you, Jesus. He loves everybody, doesn't he? <laughs> uh, oh, thank you. I needed that. <laughs> but, you know, the truth is, the truth is, in the natural, right, when we go through these difficult times, the only answer is us changing. Because I saw one of these church signs, that's what I was going to tell you, that said, if God isn't as close to you as he once was, if he doesn't seem as close to you as he once did, who moved? And at first I thought, hey, that's cool, because God never moved, right? We moved. But then I thought, you know what? I'm not doing things differently than I once did. And yet... God doesn't seem as close to me as he once did. 
And I know many Christians that could say, you know what? I'm not, I'm not, I haven't changed. But that's true. They haven't changed for worse, but they haven't changed for better. They haven't changed at all. There you go. So the truth is, as I began to ponder upon that, the Holy Spirit basically said to me, that's not the way I work. And it was like God said to me, you think you got me figured out? Come on. Who moved? Oh, yeah, I got that one figured out. And then God said to me, yeah, I do move. In fact, I even hide myself. And I, I'm like, what? And then he said, remember in Isaiah, it's chapter 45, verse 15. Surely you are a God that hides yourself. Isaiah 45, 15. Surely you are a God that hides yourself. But God isn't hiding from us. He's hiding for us. There's a big difference. What is he doing? He's saying this. He's saying, I want you to find me. It's like hide and seek in a sense, yeah. It's no, it's no game. I mean, it's, at times it can be very painful. But I'm telling you, the fact is, God is saying that I am calling you to pursue me. I'm calling you to chase after me. I'm calling you to follow me. I'm calling you to seek me. And I'm calling you to go deeper in your relationship with me. And if you want to find me, Jeremiah told us how to do it. He said, the Lord speaking through him, if you seek me, you will find me when you search for me with all of your heart. So we will seek him and we will find him but only when we search for him with all of our heart. If we anticipate in this season that we can just be casual inquirers and just have a casual relationship with God, I'm telling you that things have changed and God has raised the bar and God has raised the standard and he's saying to his church, I'm not going to leave you where you once were. I can't allow you to settle in the lease of your complacency. complacency. I've got to call you to higher heights and deeper depths because I want to use you in the season to manifest my glory on the earth earth, and it's going to require by necessity that you learn how to go to a deeper level with me. The superficial worship isn't going to work. Superficial, cursory prayer isn't going to cut it. We're going to have to learn how to travail. We're going to have to learn to intercede. We're going to have to learn to war in worship. We're going to have to wor- learn to seek after God like desperate men and women. See, if all we're doing is praying out of destitution, then we'll never experience the glory of God on the earth. I have a friend who's from Uganda. His name is John Melende. Those of you who have seen some of the transformation videos, he's on the transformation videos. And John Melende is, is, the pre, is the friend with the president and the first lady in Uganda. And I've been there and, and, and met with these people. And it, it's an amazing thing. But let me tell you this, that what John learned during the time when Idi Amin was ruling in Uganda, and then the Christians were being persecuted, everything that was happening, they went underground, and they went into, into the forest, and, and they began to pray, and they began to cry out to God. And then after a while, there was a change of regime, and Milton Obote came in, and then, you know, they, they, they prayed, and then that, there was a regime change, and then, and then all of a sudden, boom, AIDS. You know, a third of the country is going to die, or more. And, and they began to cry out to God, and they said, God, why is it? That we pray and you deliver, you know, answer our prayers and you turn things around and we think we have a reprieve, reprieve from the persecution and the repression. And then all of a sudden, you know, someone else evil comes in and then something worse happens even after that. And the Lord began to speak to the ministers and said, because you're praying out of destitution from the circumstances of your life. You're wanting your circumstances to change. You want the suffering and the persecution to stop, but you've not yet moved into a place where you're desperate for my glory and my power and my kingdom to come and fill Uganda. And until you pray out of desperation for his life, not destitution of your life, you'll never see the glory of God. You know what? It's, come on, can, can I say, can I say it this way? Can I say it this way? I'm an apostle. I'm going to say it. 
time we grow up, saints. It's time we grow up. I mean that in love. It's time that we stop whining and complaining and we suck it up, buttercups. Come on. We suck it up and realize that what God is calling us to is to a place of warfare. If you've ever been in the military, come on. You don't just get up when you want to get up. You don't sleep in the noon. You don't exercise when you want to exercise. You don't do your, your, you know, your, your, your work duties when you want to do your work duties. Because now you're enlisted. And see, we're enlisted in God's army. We're bought at a price. We're not our own. And God has called us to engage in warfare. He's called us to be disciplined soldiers. Amen? He wants to see things change. He wants us to move to that place where things change on this earth. But we're going to have to change first. Revival starts in us. We are the revival. And it happens in us. And as we go deeper and learn to go deeper with God in this season, we're going to begin to see that fruit, that life of God manifested in us and through us on the earth. Do you believe that? Come on, let's stand together. Let's stand together. Let, let me just reiterate. Church, God loves us so much. Aren't you glad that God loves you just the way you are? But let me say that he loves you so much he's not going to leave you the way you are. He wants to change us, all of us, all of us. He wants us. Let's just, just bow our heads, close our eyes. Can we get one of the guys? Can you go up on the guitar, brother, please? And I want you to understand something here, please. Now, what God is calling us to is to a place where we make his kingdom our priority, where our life is not focused. You know, life isn't about us getting what we need. He's promised that if we seek his kingdom and his righteousness and put that first, make that our priority, that everything else will be taken care of. Do you have needs? God knows that you do. They are legitimate needs. I'm not saying that God doesn't want to meet your needs. He does. He wants to meet all of our needs. He knows the things that we're in need of. But the answer comes in giving. The answer comes in serving. The answer comes in in seeking his kingdom and his righteousness first. And as we do that, and we begin to focus on doing God's will, I'm telling you, you might be going through a difficult time. You might be going through a, a, a hard time in your life right now. I have a friend who literally has, has been in ministry for years, and his wife decided one day that she was just going to get up and leave him. He hadn't done anything wrong. And he's been going through a lot, of, a lot of challenges, obviously, living alone after being married for many years. And right now, as, as we are gathered here, he's in Pakistan. And he just sent me a message. I got it literally before I, we, we left the house to come here this morning. And he said that he preached to 23,000 people just a couple of hours ago. Most of them. Pakistan is 99.6% Muslim. I have a television program in Pakistan. 99.6% Muslim. Okay. Of those 23,000 people that showed up, thousands were saved Muslims. Just, just a couple hours ago, folks. Come on. Many, many miracles happened. Many, many miracles happened. Jesus showed up in such a powerful way, revealed himself to the Muslim people. He loves the Muslim people. And he revealed himself to them. In such a powerful way. One of the miracles, he said, blind eyes, boom, 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 popping open, just all over the place. There was a, a little boy, we're going to get the video, I'll, I'll probably get access to it, put it on my website, of a, of a little child that was totally crippled, totally crippled. This child couldn't walk, and this child was instantly healed just a few hours ago and began to walk and to even run across the platform in front of thousands of Muslims. Now, what am I saying? I'm saying... This man could have just said, you know what? I'm going through so much stuff. This is so difficult. 
I'm just going to forget about other people. But what did he do? He became a giver. He became a server. And as he continued to press into God and pray, and God knows at times it's difficult. At times it seems like Paul said overwhelming beyond, beyond the ability for us to endure. But then what happens is he presses into God. He continues to do the will of God and breakthrough comes. Breakthrough comes. A sense of, 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 of the presence of God invading our lives and flooding us with his peace and his joy and, and seeing miracles. And it comes as a result of a people that will be committed to be selfless committed to serve the Lord, to do His will, and to reach other people. I want to just pray for you this morning. Just to, I'm going to pray a quick prayer before we, we turn the service over to Pastor. Here's my prayer this morning. Are you in a place where you know that God is calling you just to take your eyes off of yourself, put your eyes on Him, and begin to serve Him? If you're in that place and you know that God is saying, you know what, you need to take your eyes off of yourself, put your eyes on me, trust me with your life, and begin to serve me, then I want you just to raise your hand. I want you to raise your hand. Would you just do that? I want to pray for you because what God is calling us to, it's all of us. I've learned to do this by God's grace. My wife and I, we've We've made commitments. We've made sacrifices. The things that, that we've done, God knows. It's not anything to boast. It's not a big deal. But I'm just saying that we've made these sacrifices in order to do what God has called us to do. I would rather die on the mission field. I would rather die preaching to people that don't know Jesus than live a comfortable life over here. Because that's what's of eternal significance. So let me pray with you right now. In the name of Jesus, I thank you, Father, for those today that have responded in faith and with a commitment to follow you in the places you lead. I thank you. And today, Lord, I release in this house, I release, Father God, an anointing that will stir up, an anointing, Father God, that will send out. Lord, there's a, a sense of urgency and a sense of of wanting to give and wanting to serve and, and, and wanting to lay down lives would come upon the people. We release that anointing today. We release that anointing, Lord God. That same spirit that operated in the early church in the book of Acts that caused them to be such a generous people, such a selfless people, such a missional people. In the name of Jesus, we thank you, Father, for releasing your glory. Just say with me right now, just say this. Say, Lord Jesus, I acknowledge my life is not my own. You own me. Where you go, I will go. What you say, I will say. What you want me to do, I will do. Lord, I surrender my life. Teach me your ways. Help me to learn to hear your voice. And I make a commitment to you to press into you, to get into your word, to seek your face, and to sacrifice. God, help me. I give my life to you. And I'm telling you, saints, as we see this happen across this nation, there's going to be transformation. When the army will literally, when the body of Christ will move from being just an audience to becoming an army, that's when we're going to begin to see transformation. God is going to use you mightily as you continue to walk that out by the power of his grace in your life. God bless you, Pastor. Thank you. Sorry. I'm not the pastor. Amen. You know, before, before my husband preached, I, I was praying and I just felt like the Holy Spirit said, to look out because the fields are ripe for the harvest. The fields are ripe for the harvest. And he said to me, you know, it's the compassion that is going to win the lost. It's the compassion of Jesus in us that is going to win the lost. That's going to reach our loved ones who don't know Jesus, who are blinded, and who don't know the way. But it's going to be the love of Christ within us and the compassion. I just want to read this verse. 
It's in Matthew chapter 9. Verse 35 says, Then Jesus went about all the cities and villages, teaching in their synagogues, preaching the gospel of the kingdom, healing every sickness and every disease among the people. But when he saw the multitudes, he was moved with compassion for them, because they were weary and scattered like sheep having no shepherd. Then he said to his disciples, The harvest truly is plentiful, but the laborers are few. Amen. Amen. And just as he shared, it's when we get our eyes off of our situation, our circumstances. Sometimes we're so blinded by the things we're going through, by the toughness that we're going through, that we're walking out in life, that we forget about the harvest. And once we focus on the harvest, once we focus on Jesus, once we focus on the things he's called us to do, before we know it, the problems that we have are going to go away. They're going to dissipate because Jesus is going to answer us. So Father, we pray today in the name of Jesus that you would give us a heart of compassion for the lost. Father, we need a heart of compassion for the lost, Lord. Let us see things through your eyes. Let us see people through your eyes. Let us be moved for the one that's sitting on the corner who's waiting for someone just to tell them the love of Christ is in them and for them. Father, we praise you, God, that we know that we can go forward, Lord, but we need to stir it up within us. We need to stir up the gift of God that is within us so we can go out and be disciples like you've called us to be. We're called to be little Christ. And Father, we know, Lord, that it doesn't take long for us to be raised up so we can go out and win this nation for you, oh God. So Father, we praise you and we thank you for victory today. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen.